Last November, I started working on what I intended to be my final video of 2020 and also my second ever 10 out of 10 review of Bo Burnham's Make Happy. It wasn't the first time I had thought about how to describe at length my favorite comedy special and the odd place that it occupies in my life, but it was the first time I made a serious effort at doing so. I very nearly attended the taping at the Capitol Theater in Port Chester, New York on December 11th, 2015, invited and then not by someone who was helping fuel the quarter-life crisis I had found myself in the midst of and who may actually be the person heckling Burnham early on in the recording. In retrospect, I am grateful that I was uninvited. When I saw it on Netflix some months removed from those events, several songs still hit too close to home, uh, had I heard them at the time. But life goes on, and while Make Happy will still bring me to places I don't love being, I no longer spend hours with can't handle this open parenthesis Kanye rant close parenthesis on repeat, thinking about being the skinny kid with a steadily declining mental health, trying to make his handful of friends feel some of those things he's numb to. And sure, when I shifted to YouTube, the second half of the line took on a very different meaning, and I can't pretend like it wasn't ever true, or that longtime viewers of the channel haven't seen my mental state move like a fucking meme stock over the last year. But I have long since worked through that point in my life, primarily via a pair of one-man shows that would have been central to the review that I didn't write. Instead, they became key to my actual second 10 out of 10 review of Derek Del Gaudio's In and Of Itself. Because art is how I work through shit, a sentiment that I have repeated ad fucking nauseum lately, and you would think that I would be over this stupidly introspective bullshit. But then I was in the middle of having another existential crisis, this time caused by John Green's The Anthropocene Reviewed, when I opened up Netflix and all of a sudden Bo Burnham had dropped something new. A beautifully produced solo project made over the course of a year whose first half is extensively focused on being a straight white man on the internet using content as a coping mechanism and also turning 30. Fuck. Hello, by the way, and welcome to the Week Air Review. You can call me a straight white man, now months away from 30, and today I am talking about that project. Inside. And to give the same warning that Netflix does when you load up the show, it's gonna be some language and discussion of suicide. To save you some time, though I never actually explain why the latter part of this is true. Inside is a better comedy special than Make Happy, but it means less to me today than Make Happy did five years ago. And it's not just that Inside is better than Make Happy, it is also better than all of the other comedy specials by all of the other comedians. In fact, it is the best comedy special. And I don't say that lightly. Assassination Nation is my favorite movie, but it is not the best one, you know? And it doesn't matter that I haven't seen every comedy special, but to explain why, we have to talk about whether Inside is, at its core, a comedy special at all. On the one hand, yeah, duh. Bo Burnham repeatedly calls it one in what feels like vloggy status updates peppered throughout, saying, I've been working on this special for insert amount of time here, and I have long held the view that something is art if the creator claims it is. Trying to define art out from underneath an artist is some gatekeepy bullshit that I am not here for. So, since its creator thinks of it as a thing, it's that thing. And therefore, I can safely call it that thing and also the best one. On the other hand, it is kind of unfair on all sides to put any other special against it. To say that Inside is a better comedy special than George Carlin at USC might be true, but what the fuck does it mean? And obviously I could have put a thousand names there, but George Carlin's death is the only celebrity passing that actually made me cry, and Burnham has referenced him a few times in lyrics over the years, and also he's a goat, unquestionably. His importance to and impact on comedy is unmistakable and unassailable. And that will 
probably end up being true about Bo Burnham as well, but at the same time, I can't imagine anything in Inside will have the broad cultural impact of the seven words you can't say on television. Nothing he says will do as much for the form as Lenny Bruce's highly publicized obscenity trial. He sings about whether comedy is even appropriate at this moment in history, but Hannah Gadsby's Nanette made massive waves a few years ago as she pled her case against it, albeit for very different reasons. And while Burnham does dip his toe into some of the societal commentary that he has largely avoided until now, it doesn't have nearly the impact of Dave Chappelle going deep on the murder of George Floyd at the hands of police in 846. But so what? The reality is that Inside has basically nothing in common with any of those, while they all have something in common with each other their traditional stand-up. Nanette may have broken comedy or whatever, but it did so straightforwardly. A person standing on a stage facing out to an adoring crowd facing back. The vast majority of specials followed the exact same beats. Cute little intro scene, 45 to 90 minutes of jokes. I'm only talking about hour longs here because obviously when you're dealing with shorter performances, everything's just a little lower key. And then either a cute little outro scene or just a cut to black from an empty stage. And obviously there is more that can be done there. Kevin Hart's recording of What Now, which actually played in movie theaters, begins with a full-on comedy short. Zach Galifianakis, live at the Purple Onion, has stand-up intercut with other little sketches that are sometimes more relevant than others. Chelsea Peretti's One of the Greats does weird, fun things like having her look off stage to see herself dressed in a clown suit heckling herself. Heck, Bo Burnham has included jokes about editing in his previous live specials to remind people that what they're watching is a construction. All specials are. Despite how they appear, these things are rarely just a single performance start to finish. There are exceptions, of course, like uh, Tony Hinchcliffe's One Shot, which was filmed in one shot, I assume. I didn't particularly enjoy that special and shut it off after 20 minutes, but it probably kept going. But by and large, multiple shows are done in a night or over a couple nights at the same venue and the best bits of each get cut together. Shooting a special over time is much rarer. It happens, of course, with the most famous example likely being Chris Rock's Kill the Messenger, which contains the same material performed on three separate continents. And also crowd work shows like Dave Attell's and Todd Berry's, which were assembled from four and seven cities respectively. But generally, this is the purview of specials that function as like stand-up, documentary hybrids that make a point of putting together different shows as part of the narrative. Some recent examples include Esther Pavitsky's Hot For My Name, or they literally just released last Tuesday Half My Life by Chris Gethard, whose career suicide was the best thing I saw in 2016 and is easily in my top five comedy specials. Some folks have called Inside a sort of special documentary hybrid as well, but even if we take what it's showing us at face value, which we absolutely shouldn't, and I will talk about that in a bit, Inside is to your typical comedy documentary what Jafar Panahi's This Is Not A Film is to your typical documentary documentary. At some point, we're just not talking about documentaries anymore. <laughs> But I am even less qualified to answer the question of what is a documentary than what is a comedy special, so I'm just going to leave that thought there. Charting the progression of Bo Burnham as a comedian is fascinating because he has been in the public eye for so long now and started at such a young age. He began on YouTube as a teenager and made his first hour, words, 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 at only 19. And going back to it, you can hear the seeds of ideas that would eventually be the centerpiece of his work. Words, Words, Words is a pretty straightforward hour of comedy with a much heavier focus on stand-up than its successors, 
songs break up the talking and not the other way around. But while it is largely just a clever, if sometimes problematic, hour, it does take a hard turn into the genuinely self-reflective with the song Art is Dead that he immediately undercuts by finishing off with some more crowd-pleasing stuff. But with hindsight, that reversion feels like a hedge. Like, he didn't know if he could really pull it off and needed more confidence to commit to it. And I can relate, because I have done the exact same thing so fucking many times. But we'll get there. Point is, he was going half-ass on something that he would eventually use his whole ass for. 2013's What is much more theatrical than its predecessor, something you realize on the first frame. As someone who would leave Netflix running in his pocket and manually scrub through to listen to tracks from Make Happy on repeat before realizing that several of them were on YouTube and I could just watch them that way, I definitely wish that his later work was on Spotify or whatever, but I get that most of what he's doing at this point just doesn't translate. If you only listen to what, which did get an audio release, you spend the first nine and change minutes unable to comprehend what is actually an extended visual gag with the occasional auditory joke on top of it. Some sections are fine, but the stuff that matters aren't. Pieces like the intro, left brain, right brain, we think we know you, are very difficult to parse out of context. Something he actually calls out in the audio version, and Make Happy would be so much worse, given that, in many ways, it feels like a realization of a joke that he had made in Words, Words, Words. I'm not a comedian. I'm an artist. I don't make comedy shows. I make one-man shows. And I mean, that's a blurry fucking line these days. Mike Birbiglia's 2013 special, My Girlfriend's Boyfriend, was really my first introduction to this sort of hybridization of comedy with a serious narrative, but Birbiglia had actually performed his previous set, Sleepwalk With Me, off-Broadway, which, like, that's a whole other thing. And it is possible to distinguish between them by checking for a through line. Is it a series of jokes, or does everything tie together in a grand narrative? Berbiglia's sets tend to do the latter, but they are still classified more broadly as comedy specials, and why shouldn't they be? Why would you make comedy smaller? Following Make Happy, Burnham went on a public hiatus from performances that he actually addresses in Inside in a really heartbreaking way, but he didn't leave the world of comedy entirely. Obviously, he went to Hollywood, made the rightly beloved eighth grade, and did some acting besides, but he continued doing behind-the-scenes work elsewhere, directing two specials for other comedians, eight for Jared Carmichael, and Tambourine for Chris Rock. Obviously, comedy specials are not a director's medium. But it's not as though they have no impact at all. Earlier this year, Rock released a new version of that show on Netflix called Total Blackout, with his own name in the credits rather than Burnham's. And it adds in, you know, 30-something minutes of material that was cut out by the former director, and also makes some significant changes to the way that the same scenes play out. The New York Times has a really interesting breakdown of how the two are different and really emphasizes what Burnham brought to Rock's stand-up on a more than superficial level. Neither Tambourine nor Eight are flashy like a Bo Burnham performance, but they have the same sort of cinematic sensibilities, using light and staging in a much more subtle way, but one that still maximizes their effect. And in such interesting locations, too. Eight is shot in the round at the Masonic Hall in New York, staging a man in denim and untied work boots looking out onto a crowd of people in formal wear. Tambourine was shot at BAM in Brooklyn to a crowd of hundreds rather than Rock's typical thousands. And those venue choices inform the shows in significant ways, which just feels refreshing. 
Obviously, the vibe of a show is completely different when it's shot in Gotham Comedy Club versus Madison Square Garden, but it typically feels like the choice of location is a reflection of an artist's popularity rather than the intimacy of the set. These two specials go hard in the other direction. Putting Chris Rock mere feet away from the front row means something. Being in a venue where most of the people are looking down on him means something. Putting on Eight, a show that includes climate change ambivalence, the rejection of children as a concept, and the general indictment of any man who was a husband before the 1980s in the home of the Freemasons means something. And I get that in shows that aren't so serious, there's no real benefit to a meaningful venue, but maybe I just want more shows that are serious. And it's not like I'm not getting them or that they're not out there. This uh, therapy with the jokes movement definitely feels like it has gained serious ground, and I have listened to a whole bunch and listed many of them without mentioning Daniel Sloss, one of my favorite comedians and a guy who has seriously impacted how I think about comedy and fucking life. And to the point that I was just making, I think X was more impactful in the smaller setting I saw it performed in than the huge space that was used for the actual taping. Of course, I dig comedy that's just a bunch of goofs, but although I actually thought that Nate Bargatze's set at 2019's New York Comedy Week was the best of the three that I saw, it was the only one I didn't review because, quite frankly, I didn't have much to say other than that was a good time I just had. And indeed, I haven't thought much about that set since, and if we are TBHing, I haven't thought a ton about the ones I did review either. Certainly not to the extent that I've thought about X or career suicide. In X, Daniel Sloss makes a joke about how his specials are often like an hour of comedy followed by a 15-minute TED Talk. And if we're thinking in the abstract again, What's the difference between a biographical TED Talk and one of these more serious specials? PowerPoints? Hannah Gadsby uses a PowerPoint in Douglas to explain art history, so maybe it's pretension? Bo Burnham is clearly thought about this too. During Inside's second song, Comedy, we see him looking at a whiteboard that breaks down the current state of the industry. In movies, Two-hour indie dramedy, zero laughs. TV, mockumentaries about how fun it is to serve the state. Social media, sexually pranking unsuspecting women at public beaches. Stand-up, interesting virgins doing TED Talks. Nice. But Burnham dropped the pretentious character that joked about being an artist and not a comedian in his 20s. By Make Happy, he was saying virtually the opposite. He is an entertainer, an overpaid member of the service industry, and someone who you should toss aside the instant that he stops entertaining you. Don't defend him against detractors, and certainly don't follow him off a cliff. He doesn't know that you exist, and it doesn't matter. He needs to prove himself anew every single time, which is why he can never rest on his laurels. And he hasn't been, even if Inside seems to begin where Make Happy left off. In that show, after telling the audience that he hopes they're happy, which I've always hated because most of the many, many times I've listened to the Kanye rant, I haven't been. Burnham goes into a small room that we imagine to be a green room or something. The final song, Are You Happy, is one done by himself and honestly to himself. It's pretty bleak. But when it ends, we see sunlight coming in from around the door and he opens it to reveal his backyard and his girlfriend and their dog coming to meet him. It's a nice moment even if we are left wondering how he really feels about the whole thing. Five years later, we return to that same room with light spilling in around the door. There's a different piano and some new furniture, but it is unmistakably the same place. Burnham comes in and you are struck by how big he is compared to this small spot, something you didn't have time to internalize before. The music starts and we are treated to a very different image. 
Burnham with a face full of hair, lit by a single light off to his side. He's staring at the floor, stone-faced and dead-eyed, even as he begins to sing. The camera zooms out real slow-like, and in a beautiful moment, he sets the tone for the next 87 minutes. The lyrics reveal that he has made us some content, as he clicks on the headlamp that has been sitting at his forehead and points it towards the ceiling. It hits a disco ball that has just come into frame, and the room lights up. And we know that whatever the hell this content is, it is going to be wildly creative and visually stunning. Burnham calls himself Daddy and says to open wide. I was hooked. For the next 87 minutes, he will be in that room and we will be there with him. It turns out to not just be a room, but a full studio, complete with a kitchen, bathroom, and even a pull-out bed, therefore everything one would need in order to survive the quarantine. As someone who spent 2020 with another person in less than 400 square feet of New York City real estate, I feel confident in that assessment. And there is certainly some lying biomission here. It is not like he actually stayed in this room 24-7, 365. He never acknowledges the fact that actually he has a big old house and that same loving girlfriend and probably dog as well and so isn't actually alone in this space for a year. But that doesn't mean he doesn't feel that alone and I'm sure he does and in those moments their presence may actually make things feel worse. By the same token, he neglects to mention in a song that, sure, he built a birdhouse with his mom when he was 27, but he also released a critically acclaimed film. And while acknowledging that would undermine what he's saying, it slightly frustrates someone who at 27 did very little of consequence. But again, it is important to remember that all of this is a construction. And oh, what a construction it is. The disco ball was just the beginning. Next, we see camera and lighting tests, where he subtly flexes his professionalism by using an actual measuring tape to determine focus instead of the uh, focus peaking that the rest of us use if we use anything more than autofocus. He plays with wall lights and lights on stands and lights in hands, and it reminded me a lot of times that I have set up lights on this channel, staring into my monitor as I tested out some of my more complex or dramatic setups. And through it, we zoom in on a Panasonic Lumix S1H. When I saw the Lumix logo against that sweet, sweet shallow focus, I figured he had to be using a variant of the full frame S1 rather than the more common Micro Four Thirds GH series. And I specifically assumed the S1H because its 6K shooting capabilities would allow for these sorts of long digital zooms that give the image dynamism throughout inside while still delivering Netflix's required 4K. Comparing this shot to the fronts of both cameras confirmed my hunch because of the front dial around the shutter button, which isn't present on the stills-focused S1. Though I could have just saved myself the time by looking at the list of ridiculously specific requirements that Netflix imposes on filmmakers and seeing that the S1H is literally the only camera of its type allowed on the platform. And with a $4,000 MSRP, that is hardly a starter camera. But it's also not like he's pulling an MKBHD and shooting on a RED or even like a Canon C-Series cinema camera. I would guess that all of the gear he's using comes out to between ten dollars and $15,000, but you could decently approximate that kit for much less. Which gets to a sort of meta discussion that I think is important to address sooner than later. I fully believe that Inside will be used by a segment of the population as fodder for the argument that you can do anything if you put your mind to it. Look what Bo Burnham did with an empty room and a few thousand dollars worth of gear. He wrote, shot, directed, and edited this incredible piece. What is your excuse? I fucking hate that argument. And it made me think a bit about a good tweet that went viral in a bad way earlier this year. The entire account was deleted shortly afterwards, probably because Elijah Wood will actually did this tweet and Twitter is a cesspool, but I found it by the Wayback Machine, so good for me. It reads, Stop fucking saying you can shoot it on an iPhone. 
No, you fucking can't. Tangerine had a budget and a custom-fitted anamorphic lens adapter. Retire this example, you are gaslighting filmmakers because you are really saying you don't want it bad enough. Shut the fuck up. The argument that at some point a person needs to stop talking about a thing and eventually try to just do it makes sense when you are looking to start a YouTube channel or maybe do a short film. You can shoot those things on an iPhone or whatever other cheap camera. It's been done before and will be done again. But you definitely won't get it on Netflix. And the feature films that have been shot on iPhones that you have heard of, your Tangerines and Unsanes, they aren't suddenly possible for the masses just because a phone takes pretty good video now. Those films had $100,000 and $1.5 million budgets, respectively. If they had been shot on a medium-priced SLR or mirrorless camera, the budgets would have been virtually the same. Pointing to a film like Tangerine and saying, they did it, why can't you, also fundamentally misses the fact that it took a white guy to tell the story of two black trans women. Inside caused much less in dollar terms, but it was made by someone who had the time to dedicate to it. Unlike most of the people stuck inside twiddling their thumbs during the last year, Bo Burnham did not have to stress about his next paycheck throughout the pandemic. He was, perhaps still is, mentally in a bad place, but that is a very different kind of stress than a lot of people have been under. There have been a million articles about the fact that the uh, push for pandemic productivity was dangerous and the fact that Bo Burnham made something amazing during this time does not change that one iota. But at the same time, I think it serves as an interesting marker of where so-called pandemic art might go in the years to come. I've been saying privately since last July that I think good pandemic art will come in retrospect, but that I think it will exist. I know others disagree, and I do agree that this whole thing has been all bad with no discernible silver lining, but there are a lot of purely bad things that have inspired great art. It matters what the art centers on. For example, a few weeks ago, I went to my first live theatrical production in a year, and I'm still working out how to write about it, because it's not just pandemic art in that it was conceived and executed during the last year. It's also about a pandemic. Not the one we've all been living through, though. But one nonetheless. And that is certainly a way to go, but it's not the only one. And it's not where Bo Burnham went, thank fuck. Instead, he went deep on the way that society reacted, with an obvious emphasis on his and my generation. Although he is not very online in the way that he was when he was younger, he clearly has an intuitive understanding of how social media works, which allows him to effectively critique it without sounding like a fucking boomer. And perhaps ironically and definitely unfortunately, it probably helps that he's depressed. A few weeks ago, I saw a headline that I can no longer find about the glut of suicide-adjacent content on TikTok and the issues around moderation. The next time I scrolled my For You page, I became keenly aware of how chock-full it was of teens and 20-somethings joking about unaliving themselves. And I thought, huh, I guess they were right and went uh, right back on to liking all of them so that I would stay on the fun part of TikTok. Shortly thereafter, I was listening to La Di Die by Nessa Barrett featuring Jixton, and for the first time, I thought about the fact that not 20 seconds into the song, Barrett sings, I'll be dead at 27, only nine more years to go. And that a few weeks prior, I had been rocking out to Smart Death's track, She Told Me to Kill Myself, on repeat for days. The second line of which is, as if I hadn't been working on it. And when Bo Burnham says that he hopes that maybe Inside can do for us what it did for him, i.e. keep him distracted from the desire to put a bullet into his brain, I thought, yeah, 
that makes sense, with only the vaguest awareness that that's probably not a good thing. Now, let us be clear that I am not, at this point in my life, particularly enticed by the idea of killing myself, but I definitely have been. It's something I talked a bit about in my review of Dear Evan Hansen, which someone recently told me sounded disingenuous and that they didn't believe me. But that's their baggage, I guess. I don't know. Even if the last year had been all peachy keen, enough of my late teen to adult life has been spent around the edge that the idea that someone wouldn't periodically think about it seems a whole lot weirder to me than the other way around. And so when I watch TikToks that joke about it or songs that croon about it or whatever else, it's like, duh, the world is fucked. <laughs> How are you supposed to cope with it? An entire generation replaces the laugh cry emoji with a skull. That's how. And given that mental health has long been a key part of Bo Burnham's work, of course suicide has been as well, most explicitly with the song Kill Yourself from Make Happy that satirizes big anthemic songs like Katy Perry's Roar, which does take some time to say that it is a serious epidemic and anyone who is actually considering self-harm should seek help, which, to be clear, is correct. If that is you, please talk to someone about it. But if you get your courage from overproduced pop bullshit, eh. And of course, this is a joke. He apologizes for it literally as soon as the song ends and clarifies that he doesn't actually think people should kill themselves. Point is, it's something that's come up before. But when it appears inside, it's different. For one thing, he's pretty much always talking about it in relation to himself and how he's feeling. That thing that I just said where I clarified that actually I don't really want to die, Burnham does that too. But it takes a much darker turn as he fails to find the words that might comfort someone who is struggling with issues of their own. But he wants you to understand that it is all part of the show. Even on top of the insincere insincerity in this rant, there's the art of it all. He's projecting this clip onto himself, clearly months later given the difference in beard length. And the face of the present shows us nothing at all. I mentioned before that Bo Burnham has long brought attention to the construction of his performances, and that is even truer here, though it is a bit more subtle. Back in Make Happy, Burnham made very clear that nothing he's saying is actually true. After faking out the audience with a not-improvised improv song, he tells them, I am not honest for a second up here. If you want to see an honest comedian, go see the rest of them. We already discussed how the entire premise that he is alone during all this is false. But it doesn't stop there. Throughout, we are shown what seem to be bits of rehearsal or mistakes, but there is no way that the restart we see in Stuck in a Room was done organically, or the one more at its end. A bit in the back half where he breaks down because he doesn't know what to say, forcing him to storm all the way across the studio to turn off the camera because he put the camera about as far away as we have seen in the room more crowded than we've ever seen is so clearly staged to make that storming as dramatic as possible. And that sounds kind of cynical, but it's not. The scenes in the production help bring us into his headspace. In songs that are more overtly comedic, like White Woman's Instagram or the 80s-inspired banger Problematic, you aren't being shown a cable-strewn floor or how he sets up and changes his lights in the moment. Your full attention is on the goofs. But when the mood shifts, everything gets a little less clean. And none of this is an accident or a mistake. The idea that he actually turned 30 in his studio alone and just so happened to perfectly time his monologue as the clock approached midnight is ludicrous. I'm sure there are a dozen takes or more where he stares at the clock just a moment too long or too short. But seeing that would hurt the show. And dishonest is not the same as inauthentic. 
I am sure that most of these seemingly secret glimpses into his emotional state are at least inspired by what was happening when the camera wasn't running, and so he put in the most interesting version of them on screen. Just because your tears are fake doesn't mean you don't feel like crying. And in considering authenticity, I think it becomes clear that inside, at least for the first two-thirds or so, is a peek into an alternate universe where Bo Burnham still had a YouTube channel in the year of our Lord 2020. Like, every other aspect of his career had followed the same track, but he had just kept posting or maybe started up again once he got stuck inside. He warns us early on that this thing that may as well be a, a channel trailer, the whole thing is, is going to be kind of all over the place, which, you know, relatable. And he is right. We get a funny song, and then a weird meta sketch, and then a guy sitting and talking to his camera, and then blending of those produced by one guy in one place. Feels like YouTube. And that's not to say that Inside should have been a curated playlist on a YouTube channel. While the satirizations of reaction videos or Let's Plays might hit a little harder if they had been done on the platforms that they were skewering, your relationship to this video is obviously much different than it would be if the exact same thing had been posted to Netflix. For one thing, I bet a lot more people would still be watching this far into the video. Being on Netflix doesn't quite mean what it used to, as the glut of content has made any given release on the platform less interesting than it was five years ago. But I know that when I sit down on the couch to watch 87 Minutes on Netflix, I'm planning on sitting there for 87 minutes and watching the whole dang thing. My attention might wane at times, but I'm in it to win it, and that is not true at all on YouTube. I regularly watch very long videos on this here platform, but I watch them on my laptop or my phone as I am doing other things. Unless it's a big release from someone like ContraPoints or Tim Rogers, I will almost certainly start and stop and put my laptop down and forget I was watching the video and end up with a half dozen partly finished videos among the several dozen open YouTube tabs that I know deep down that I will never get through, but I just can't bring myself to close. And that's just how it is. Like, it is, it is pretty impressive if you have made it this far, but I imagine that even you probably aren't super dedicated to watching this video. When you realize that the intro was a gorgeous fluke, and instead of a regular video essay, it is just some loser talking to you for a really fucking long time, you probably started treating it like a podcast. Maybe you're in the shower, or in your car, or someone else's car. I'm not your mom, I don't know your fucking life. <laughs> but Inside deserves to be given your full attention and seen in its entirety with maybe a single break at its intermission. It is definitely the case that some bits land better than others, but this isn't like Saturday Night Live where you're just better off watching the handful of good sketches on YouTube each Sunday. And it is unfortunate that so many people will do exactly that. Hell, have done exactly that. In the immediate wake of the show's release, I saw rips of virtually every song recommended to me on YouTube. My TikTok For You page has been flooded with clips and comments as well. And of course, there are a few that show up more than others because some of the songs are more broadly digestible. But I fully agree that Welcome to the Internet was the right piece for Burnham to post to his own channel to rep the show. I think it is better in context with the whole special, but it gains new meaning being on a platform that has had such an outsized role in giving everyone everything all of the time. That line certainly means more on YouTube than it does on Netflix. And speaking of politics, the most obvious bit to be clipped was in fact the first one I saw, Burnham's performance with Sako the Sock Puppet called How the World Works. In it, he sings a pretend children's song about how the world is built on all life coming together in this incredibly superficial way before his anti-capitalist hand costume well actually the fuck out of him. 
The TikTok showed only the latter with the caption, where's the lie? And actually, I want to make a small but important critique here because when I was watching the special, I was immediately reminded of a broader discourse thing that I don't know the name of, and honestly, I'm not politically pure enough to make, but oh well. So Sako initially presents as an incredibly reasonable and factually accurate puppet with a statement that the version of history we've been taught is just false, and that the world is built with blood and genocide and exploitation. Great. But then he moves into conspiracy. The FBI killed MLK. And lefty talking points that a lot of people knee-jerk reject, like private properties inherently theft. I believe that Bo Burnham thinks that the history that we are taught in schools is bad. I don't believe that he believes that every single politician and cop is working to protect the interests of the pedophilic corporate elite. But he puts those two things in the same verse of a song. And depending on the beliefs that you bring into the show, you will hear it in radically different ways. A few years back, I worked with a guy who was probably in DC on January 6th, and before I really understood how far gone he was, I engaged him in a few political discussions in which he would just troll me by doing things like lumping Snopes and Mother Jones in with the onion. And though this TikTok was being shared on the lefty side of the app, I could just as easily see him posting the exact same thing with a different caption claiming it was actually aimed at the left. And look how dumb these people are, believing all of this bullshit. That said, this doesn't really matter because it isn't really the point of the bit. What at first seems to be a critique of oppression quickly reveals itself to be a demonstration of it. The literal puppeteer asks what to do, and the puppet becomes frustrated at being forced to teach basic humanity to a rich white guy. But as things become more pointed, the puppeteer becomes angry, and literally figuratively pummels them into submission, threatening them with the void that they exist in any time he doesn't see fit to offer them a platform. And when the puppet has calmed down and accepted their place, well, the puppeteer forces them off anyway, because of course he does. This all feeds into a pretty constant theme in Burnham's work throughout his career, about his place in the world, and now his place in a moment with increasing unrest and public division, epitomized by one of the show's first lines. What can a white guy do while still getting paid and being the center of attention? I'm not in this for the money, but we can't pretend like my self-centered YouTube channel on which I pretend to review things so that I can talk about myself is not a function of my self-centeredness. And I am super aware of it and can pretend that makes it okay, but as Burnham says, self-awareness does not absolve anybody of anything. And yet, why shut up when I can just not do that? Us straight white men have collectively had the floor for hundreds of years, but what about me? And my guess is that on some level you are bothered by what I just said while also being conflicted because, like, you're a lot of fucking minutes into this. So you have clearly accepted the idea that this particular white guy must have something worth saying at least some of the time. Sucks, right? It's not like any of this is new, but the fact that Burnham is using not just comedy, but musical comedy, means it just sticks in your head so much more. And one of the fundamental differences between Inside and the previous specials is that the songs feel so much more like songs. Many of them are longer, and he goes back to the chorus much more than usual, occasionally to the detriment of the show's pacing. Like, I'd bop to this shit for sure, and lines like, Making a literal difference metaphorically, with its descending melody, is going to be in my head forever in a way that that exact line told flat just wouldn't. 
And of course I wish that there was an album so I could bop, but the visuals do so much to make the points land far more concretely than they ever could on stage. All of the beautiful design was crucial to make Happy success, and there are a handful of moments where it gets to be the center of attention, but while the Kanye rant is visually stunning, the effects aren't part of the joke. There's only so much you can do in a live setting. But with Inside, the imagery itself can be in on the joke, is in on the joke. And Burnham takes full advantage of his ability to craft every single image into something amazing, whether that's a quick insert gag or changing colors and aspect ratios, using lights in visually striking ways. Plus, ever since I watched Zardoz in sophomore year of college, I have felt like projections are a woefully underused form, and clearly Burnham agrees because dude goes fucking hard with them. And also, everything. This whole thing goes hard. While writing, I saw this TikTok where a white woman compares her actual Instagram photos to the mocking setups he did in white woman's Instagram. And ouch. But the fact that I think that may be Inside's most gorgeous bit probably means I am unironically into that aesthetic. Which, fuck. But what else was he gonna do? Other comedians have released specials during quarantine, like Mary Lynn Ricegub's Live from the Pandemic, where she's just standing in her garage in front of some colored lights and doing her thing. And that's fine, a bit awkward, but fine. But Bo Burnham has never been a traditional stand-up. He has been known and lauded for the complexity and precision of his design, and that was before he was a celebrated feature film director. If Bo Burnham made live from the pandemic in a garage or even like a facsimile of his childhood bedroom, it would, it'd be weird. Like I'm sure it would be funny and whatever, but anyone tuning in would be at least confused and almost certainly disappointed. Five years waiting after Make Happy for that? Plus, it's not like he released the thing for free on YouTube the way he did What back in 2013. You probably do have a Netflix subscription, but that shit is getting more expensive every year, and cheaper competitors are making that number harder and harder to justify. And I'm not saying that Inside needs to single-handedly justify the monthly cost, but it's also not like he could just slap something together and put it out, even if he had wanted to, and we all know that he didn't, because how could he? Going back to the awkwardness thing, by keeping the performance dynamic and visually interesting, he is able to largely avoid the very strange silences that plagued a lot of regular comedians who went virtual over the last year. And we saw some people who figured it out and a lot of people who didn't so much, because it is hard to sit here alone in a room and make jokes. Because if someone says a punchline in a forest and there is no one around to hear it, it's not really a joke. Comedy requires at least two people, but so much of what you see on YouTube is asynchronous. As Burnham says early on, it is just me and my camera, and you and your screen the way our Lord always intended. That's the internet, right? With maybe the sole exception of Good Mythical Morning, where the crew is on set to be the laugh track, this here platform consists of people joking into a void. But for that reason, the jokes are different. And we've all gotten used to it, but YouTube comedy is not comedy special comedy. And so Burnham asks, does anyone want a joke when no one's laughing in the background. And I come up with one answer, Drew Michael. In 2018, Michael released his self-titled special on HBO, directed by Jared Carmichael of Eight, directed by Bo Burnham fame. This special feels exactly two years ahead of its time because it is a comedy special done without an audience. Michael stands alone against a black background not entirely dissimilar from the one that was featured in my recent videos, shouting into a literal rather than figurative void.
The only time we ever see another person is with the occasional cut to a Skype or whatever conversation that he is having with a woman who we see in close-up in her own colored void some unknown distance away. These calls exist outside of the monologue, though. Fundamentally, this is just an hour of him in a dark room with the camera that he is talking to about a wide variety of subjects such as disability, Brussels sprouts, suicide, herpes, and incest. So much about incest. <laughs> And he's saying this to no one. By choice, Michael and Carmichael together came up with the idea because they felt it would make the special stand out and just generally complement the material. Again, Carmichael saw great success with Eight, and the staging really does play into its impact. And the same is true here to an even greater degree. A comedy show to a crowd of suits is odd. A comedy show to absolutely no one is bananas. And it's worth knowing that his material was tested in the usual way, performed in clubs to see what worked and didn't. In watching it, you can feel where the laughs would have been, and also the types of laughs that there were, which isn't really the case with Inside, though Burnham actually uses a laugh track a few times. As someone who has been to an Anthony Jeselnik show, I can perfectly imagine the increasing hysteria in the audience as Michael goes deeper and deeper on the idea that life would just be way easier if everyone would marry their moms because, hey, you already love each other. But it's not there. Instead, it's just a dude yelling at you about it. And that hits real different. A lot of comedy taken out of context of the performance is pretty unhinged, but you don't realize it until the audience is taken away. You can't understand how critical audience reaction is to your impression of a comedy special until you've seen it done without one. But it works here because it is depicting a man losing his fucking mind. Drew Michael ends with a berating that reminded me a whole heck of a lot of my second one-man show. Honesty is being open and being vulnerable. It's not just standing in front of everyone and telling them that you fucking suck, he's told. You've constructed this whole elaborate way to never change. Where is the funny? None of this has been funny. But of course, he wrote that. He may not have said the words, but they were his. And it's that exact sort of thing that folks like he and I and Bo Burnham Use as a second-level con. By calling ourselves out on our bullshit, we're not just stopping criticism in its tracks, we're getting the people who rightly saw through the bullshit to think, hey, you know what? At least he gets it. And then they heap praise upon us while we sit, hoping that no one goes down to that next level. Inside's best meta joke, a reaction video that goes on about four times longer than one would expect, forces him to confront his motivations and acknowledge the artificiality of each layer of performance as the cosmic horror of the slightly delayed feed of his current existence just keeps being streamed in. And that probably won't mean as much to you as it does to me. But you can still just enjoy the joke. When it is a joke. I kind of lied to you like 45 minutes ago or whatever when I said that Bo Burnham referred to Inside as a comedy special. He doesn't. He just calls it a special. Now, comedy may be implied, but as with everything else, the lack of a word is intentional. There are a lot of genuine laugh-out-loud moments in Inside that anyone can enjoy, but there's at least as much that requires you to have at some point been in a headspace like the one he is in to really appreciate it. A lot of this stuff would probably be pretty off-putting to a lot of folks. And sometimes the punchlines clearly aren't looking for a laugh. There's a substantial turning point in the last third-ish with the song Funny Feeling, which hints at dozens of jokes without ever actually making one. It is the point where Inside becomes most like a traditional special while also being the point where it stops trying to be funny. 
a week out from my first watch and a couple days from my second, this is also where I keep finding myself returning. Aside from the complete watches, I have spent hours replaying individual segments, both because I wanted to make sure that I was quoting things right and accurately representing what I was seeing for this, you know, monstrosity, but also because I just fucking wanted to. Like, I, I don't know if I've been clear enough that Inside is really, really good. But the ones that I have been returning to for myself haven't been those YouTube type bits. I talked at length about the sketch with Sako and could have talked at least as long about Problematic. But when I think about what moment I want to be there with, I keep coming back to the same place. Hands up, open parenthesis, eyes on me, close parenthesis. It's fitting because that song is Inside's equivalent to Make Happy's Kanye rant, which I will reiterate, I have watched well over 100 times at this point. A big show-stopping number that makes heavy use of vocal effects and serves as the emotional peak, after which things quiet down and we get one final song played at the piano. It also contains the line that stuck with me most of the entire show. Now, I'm not sure that anyone has ever said anything that has struck me in quite the way that Bo Burnham did when he said something I paraphrased way back at the beginning of this. Come and watch the skinny kid with a steadily declining mental health and laugh as he attempts to give you what he cannot give himself. Me. That was me. In many ways, it still is. The last year, it's definitely felt like that at times. And Inside is full of incredible lines, even if none of them drill down into my soul like that one did. On Wednesday, a Facebook friend posted a quote from Funny Feelings, which immediately proceeds hands up. The whole world at your fingertips, the ocean at your door. And like, fuck, what a beautifully evocative image. One that is so reflective of what this last year has felt like, especially for millennials and Gen Z. We were supposed to go out and change the world. Everything is there for me, but I can't open the door. And it's about so much more than the pandemic. The ocean is capitalism and systemic oppression. It's also just the fucking ocean. And it was the return of that image in, in the next song that really hit me. After an incredibly depressing interlude where Burnham talks about his hiatus from live performance, he says, You say the ocean's rising like I give a shit. You say the whole world's ending. Honey, it already did. You're not going to slow it. Heaven knows you tried. Got it? Good. Now get inside. I've recently come to see myself as an ambivalent nihilist. I genuinely don't want to believe that not only is all of this meaningless, but also I am meaningless. And yet, the ocean's rising and it's raging, and there's fuck all any of us can do to stop it. I am constantly fighting against the impulse to just shut down because the world is so fucked. And even if one aspect of it is getting better, plenty else is getting worse. How to care, even when you know that you have no power, is one of the key questions of this moment, and it is one that I have struggled with for as long as I have thought about anything outside of myself. I spent a year inside for the greater good, and yet nearly 600,000 Americans are dead. Would it have been more if I hadn't? If I'd just gone down south and partied with all the other 20-somethings who didn't give a shit? Probably not. 2020 made clear that collective action is the only kind that matters and also that individualism continues to reign. So what do you do? Make a comedy special? Clip it for TikTok? Review it on YouTube? Comment on the YouTube review? Anything to remind the world that you exist. That's all this is. But please, keep your eyes on me.
Thank you so much for watching, and thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, Hammer and Marco, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, Magnolia Denton, Elliot Fowler, Greg Lucina, Kojo, Phil Bates, Willow, I Am The Sword, Tomatown One, Timo, and the folks who'd rather be read than said. If you like this video, that's great. If not, oh well. If you want to see more, please subscribe. I hope to see you in the next one.